Now that, we're, now that we're both completely depressed, <laughs> <laughs> can we, is there any psychiatrist in the audience that could step in right now? But uh, now that we're completely... Right. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, I'll tell you... Welcome to Tanak Talk. I'm your host, William Hall, broadcasting live, Kingsland, Texas, USA, with another episode of Rabbi Toby Singer's Let's Get Biblical Q and A. Welcome back, yes. Rabbi. How are you this this day today? I was going to say amazing. Depends on where you're at, I guess you could say. Things are still things are still really hot and bothered in uh, Israel, and uh, our prayers are definitely with Israel and her people, no doubt. Uh, Rabbi, how's your father? He's, how is he doing? He's, um, he's alive, which is a miracle, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, I don't know, what is it now? Is it three, four months ago? That, you know, her father has stage four, and... A few, quite a few months ago, they didn't think he had more than a few hours or a few days. You know, I cried more in the last four months than I have in my entire adult life. Mm. And, but, you know, as uh, as it would turn out, hundreds of thousands of people around the world are praying for him. Mm -hmm. I mean, the doctors who um good people who you know tell me to prepare for the worst imminently um are speechless and my father is alive in fact he he had a a nice day a few days ago when my nephew his grandson who has a beautiful voice, great, you know, has a beautiful singing voice, was next to my dad in the hospital room and singing some just, you know, traditional Jewish songs. And my father, his head was up a little bit. I mean, it's like, and his hand was moving. Nice. nice. Which is unimaginable. It's a miracle in itself, no doubt. Yeah. I mean, it means... Like two weeks ago, in order for me to get him, um, in order for him to convey that he um, understood what I was saying, he can move his eyes a little bit. There's no hand squeezing mm. anymore and so on. But that was like a really amazing. Wow. So I don't, I don't know. It's, it, it's, it's, um, yeah, it's very, very much a miracle. Um, it's, and we're coming to his 91st birthday. He should live to 120. I mean. So he's, so he's a miracle. How, how's your wife doing? She's doing better. Um, the, the one, one problem she's having is. It's minor, but it's giving her discomfort like pretty much all the time is from the surgery that she had. There's uh, there's a there was a fluid buildup in her back, like underneath the tissue uh, where they mm. where they sewn it together. And they knew it was there and they weighed out the options and said, just let it just let it sit. And it'll eventually kind of get back into her system the way it's supposed to be. But until it does, it's really hard for her to get comfortable. She can't drive in a car. The, her only comfortable position right now really is just standing up, you know, just standing up, moving around. But of course, you can't do that forever. So, um, but she's, she's, a, she's a trooper, sure. Um, everything else so far that we know of is going well. We've got to go back for, uh, for immunotherapy by recommendation. And uh, we're waiting for the doctors to, uh, um, they got a whole lot of, of hoops to jump through. You can't just make an appointment now. You've got to get another doctor and they have to refer you to this doctor, then they have to refer you. And it's like, that's frustrating. Um, but other than that, uh, Baruch Hashem, they, they believe they got all of the cancer out 
whatever the case may be. Six, six lymph nodes, two arms. They found one little tiny tumor in one of the six. Um, the doctor was surprised. She actually thought there was going to be a lot more based on how big the surgery was. Uh, but Baruch Hashem, she's doing better. So thank oh, you all for your prayers and support. And thank you for asking, Rabbi. Um, you know, on, on behalf of all the viewers, I you know, wish your wife a Rafu Shalema, and we all send our love to her, our blessings. and Thank you. And she is in our thoughts. I mean, thank and you. As you are. Thank you. And she should have a Rafu Shalema, a complete recovery. I mean, very nice. Um, Thank you. Very yeah, much. yeah. Have a complete recovery, Baruch Hashem. I mean, so, yeah. All right. Well, now that we're in the recording session of this thing, just now that, as... we're, now that we're both completely depressed, <laughs> <laughs> can we? Is there any psychiatrist in the audience that could step in right now? But uh, now that we're completely right. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's. I'll tell you, you know, That's, life is yeah. like. Uh, it can get tough sometimes. It's really a threat, you know. Every day, all of us, you, I, mm -hmm. every person, is attacked by cancer. We get mm -hmm. uh, the oncologist who I became quite friendly with, who, you know, said that every day you get cancer, mm -hmm. except our bodies fight it, you know, fight these cells that are acting irregularly. And every day we're attacked, right now, we're all being attacked with infection. And our, you know, our white blood cells are there and all kinds of, there's a war going on in our bodies right now. Right now. Mm -hmm. And we're having this conversation. There's, there's an, an existential war going on in our bodies. And without knowing it, we, HaKosh Baruch Hu, said our body is unbelievable that our bodies are fighting a battle for our survival mm -hmm. we have to thank HaKadosh Baruch Hu. amazing miracle miracle that we're alive and we shouldn't take it for granted a religious Jew even after going to the bathroom we, we make blessings and I remember one time flying next to a I forgot the name of it. So he's a doctor for kidneys. There's a name for it. Uh, I think it starts with an N. But whatever mm -hmm. it was, he was like, you have no clue what your kidneys are doing. <laughs> he was, I, and he's not the only guy. I've met guys who are kidney specialists many times, liver specialists. Never one of these guys, none of them were atheists. All of them believed in God. Wow, that's awesome. I never met a guy who... Nice. I'm sure he's out there, but I never met a guy who specializes in... You know, he's a kidney specialist or a... Or a the guys, all they do is liver, you know? They, you have no idea what's, what your liver is doing every second. I just have to thank HaKosh Baruch every moment. Mm -hmm. Every moment. We're, uh, so... Yeah, so I'm an Arab Israel. People ask, are you worried about being in Israel? Our whole, all bodies, no matter where we are, are mm -hmm. under attack constantly. Right. And they have to think HaKadosh Baruch Hu every moment. It's an unbelievable thing. Unbelievable. Every day, our lives are saved. There's a mechanism that's fighting a battle, and we don't even know it. Mm -hmm. We don't even know it. So, you know, right now, Israel's enduring something that's the, its longest war. It's and it could, it's not that it could spread easily, but um, it could expand. Sure. Even though all the players are already, all the interlocutors are at work, but it could expand at any moment. Yeah. Very serious business. Jerusalem usually is very calm and quiet. You wouldn't know it from reading the newspapers, I imagine, but Jerusalem is generally a more quiet place. They don't like to shoot rockets at Jerusalem because there are hundreds of thousands of Arabs that live here and they have the uh -huh. Zalaksa. They don't like to shoot Yishalayim. They'd rather shoot at places where they're almost certainly going to kill a Jew. So mm -hmm. they would rather shoot at Ashkelon or in Tel Aviv. You know, those are not all Jewish cities, but almost all Jewish. So, 
Um, very serious. We're living in a in a time which there'll be generations, a thousand years, we'll speak about what's happening now. It's really remarkable. Right. So, yeah. Your wife should have a refuah shalema. She should read and study and meditate on Psalm 57 and 58. Okay. 57 and 58. I'll make sure she gets that. Yeah. Here's our first question. Hi. Uh, my name is Hany. I'm calling from Canada. Um, my question is... Uh, I grew up Christian for many years. I used to teach at Sunday school. But thanks to uh, the teachings of Rabbi Tobia and other things too, so I I pulled out of the church completely. And as I look back, it, I can see all the issues that I that, that are in the church and you know the church community and everything. So to get to the point, I'm still a little bit struggling with like forgetting all about Jesus and stuff like that. Because I used to remember to pray in the name of Jesus, and even sometimes I have a dream that I there's demons and I call the name of Jesus and the demons die. Things like that is still kind of stuck in my mind. And also, when I pray to the God of Israel, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and I really try, but sometimes I don't feel like I'm heard or there's an answer. Where in Christianity, it was all like a lot of fuzzy feelings that I would get. So... That's, a, that's the thing that I'm struggling with. So, I don't know. I uh, Hopefully, to uh, hear some thoughts from um, from Rabbi. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Right. Okay. Yeah. Right, take it away. Well, you know, it's interesting that I think that uh, both of your questions are not just interrelated and intimately synchronized, but that you're essentially asking the same question and it's coming from a deep place in your heart I will confess that I'm very envious of you I've never been a Christian not for even a moment moreover when I I I didn't appreciate the Christian religion as a kid because I knew what happened to Jews in Christian countries just 15 years before I was born But when I learned about it, I was even more repelled by it. Um, but you, um, you didn't need any of this. You were a teacher in Sunday school, I think you said, and someone who studied Christianity. And for you to turn to the God of Israel and to repent of idolatry is... A, an amazing thing. Your word will be very great. I, I, I'm jealous of you because I will never have such an opportunity to renounce Christianity. You're so favored in the eyes of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. You know that? Just smile. I'll never know the ecstasy that a ex-Christian has when he renounces Avoidizer of foreign worship. There are two parts to um, to the to why uh, Christianity is 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 a religion that's so attractive. Now Christians will tell you that there are hundreds of prophecies in the Hebrew Bible that point to Jesus. But those quotes are all spurious. And people discover that and realize that the core tenets of the Christian religion are fatuous. Not only are they without merit, not only are they unsupported by Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible, but the prophets of Israel condemned its teachings. So people are able, just like people enjoy all kinds of drugs, I'm sure, but people realize, cognitively realize, that this is going to kill me. They quit. People smoke, enjoy it. People who do heroin or whatever, enjoy it. I was interviewed many times on another show with the host, 
was a heroin addict, which intrigued me. I used to ask him, what's heroin like? Is it like having too many drinks? He said, no, you have no idea. It was the greatest ecstasy in the world. But ultimately, he was within an inch of death, and he quit. Amazing thing. But you, you have to, in a sense, understand the attraction of Christianity. And I think it, it came through exquisitely within the very words of your question. The reason why one out of three people on this planet are a Christian of one sort or another, the reason why it's the most popular religion in the world, just share numbers, is because Christianity delivers on two of our worst character traits. Our worst character trait that infects every st stupid decision we've ever made is low self-esteem. If you think back in your life to every decision, every stupid decision you've ever made that you deeply regret, you so wish you can just click the proverbial control Z on your emotional keyboard and just go back and redo it again. Like, how did I do something so dumb? You almost certainly, every critical mistake you've made, poor judgment, was made when your self-esteem was not way up here, but way down here. Conversely, if you think about the great decisions you've made in your life that you're very grateful you did, you're probably your self-esteem was way up here. But as it turns out, low self-esteem, when you look in the mirror and you see someone who's unattractive, not only physically, but emotionally. So, um, so that, that's where Christianity is able to infiltrate your psyche, is able to, to, to damage you, because Christianity affirms that. If you feel lost, if you feel like you're a sinner, if you feel like there's nothing you can do to satisfy God, if you feel like God hates you and is angry at you, and he could never forgive you, so a religion like Christianity is perfect because it affirms it. It actually conveys to you that you are a sinner and there's nothing you can do to save yourself. As strange as it seems, as, as I'm speaking right now live, it's Sunday morning in the United States. Millions of people are sitting in churches and they're listening to this sermon, which goes on in every church, every church. The pastor hammers it in that you're a sinner, you're lost, there's nothing you can do to save yourself. Because you were infected with the original sin, which is explicitly in the Christian Bible, specifically in the letters of Paul. And in fact, the most influential letter of Paul, it's so tragic that the book of Romans was ever written. The world would have been a very different place if that epistle had never been penned. But in the book of Romans, in chapter 5, verse 12, we're infected with the original sin. There's nothing you can do to save yourself. You're lost. There are even iterations of Christianity that amp that up, that juice that spiritual sickness up by saying that you're so lost you can't even be a Christian. And therefore, you either chosen to be a Christian before you were born, God shows that you would be a Christian, therefore the gospel will be irresistible, or you were chosen not to be saved, and, the, and you, there's nothing you can do to be a Christian. And that's Reformed theology. The, this idea emerges from the mind of a man who ran Geneva like a police state, Calvin who didn't invent this, but took it from Augustine. 
uh, a Manichaeist, the Bishop of Hippo, probably, the, no, the most influential uh, church father who took these ideas from Paul and he just amped it up. He, his Manichaeism, which means he saw this were the religion he came from was Manichaeism is a dualistic kind of religion in that it it viewed this world as a very sinful, dark world, a broken world, and the celestial world is perfect. And this world is just a horrible place. That's it all is part of a neoplatonic thinking, completely in opposition to the Jewish faith. In any event, that, that's how far you can go because once you go off, so then it, there's just multipliers. Imagine that. So you have to be very aware of this, very aware of this. So it, it, it is Baruch Hashem, I envy you that you were able to say, I reject all kinds of foreign worship. That's what the word Avoid the means. And you now worship the God of Israel. But it's very important to ask HaKosh Baruch for wisdom and to say, Hashem, I love you. I want to have Devekus with you. I want to, to cleave to you. It's a mitzvah, dear Isa. It's a commandment from the Torah to be close to Hashem. A separate mitzvah. Besides believing in one God, worshiping one God, and all, every person, it's not only for Jews, but for non-Jews as well. It's part of the seven Noachai laws of worshiping the true God, can, cleaving to the true God, to have a personal relationship with Hashem. That's a separate mitzvah, you know that? There's a mitzvah in the Torah, they're all interconnected, to be revolted by idolatry. Do you know that? If you see an idol and it bothers you and you're revolted by it, it's like you put it on film. It's a mitzvah from the Torah, shak is the shak sanu. You should be utterly disgusted by it and if you're not, if you pass by a church in Rome, Athens, St. Petersburg, and it doesn't bother you to see statues, that means there's something wrong. You can fix it, but you need to go to a spiritual doctor. So it's a symptom that's not, not all there. Now, what happens, I think, that people cognitively, as you conveyed, understand that the claims of the church are completely fatuous. However, there are many people that never thought about what makes Christianity attractive emotionally. So they don't alter that part. So people very often continue feeling that they live in a world with uncontrollable forces and you specifically can control them. That's why your questions are the same. You said you used to, there were demons all around or you imagined or dreamed them, but you called out the name of Jesus. Why, why, why you're creating the image of Hashem? Why can't you ask HaKadosh Baruch Hu solace in your life? Because the mindset hasn't been changed, hasn't changed. This is very critical. The mindset hasn't changed to a degree. It's very important to understand that Akkadosh Baruch who loves you, you are created in his image and he just wants to be close to you. And it's a little difficult when you feel insignificant and worthless as Christianity conveys. Now, I don't want to, no Christian pastor, I don't think that you're worthless. It, with the way they'll frame it is that there's nothing you can do to adequately satisfy God, because God is too remote. This is highly dualistic, real Neoplatonic, real Pauline, real... All, now, incidentally, the Orthodox Church, capital O, and the Roman Catholic Church, to their credit, reject Calvinism. They can't stand it. They hate Reformed theology. But the idea that man cannot save himself is across the board in, in, because Paul says so, openly, openly. Misquotes Tanakh up and down in Romans 3. It really, wow, 
what he brought, so much idolatry and destruction to the world. But you have to, in a way, respect this idolatry, meaning how effective it is, how it metastasizes, how it is so addictive. Why is it so? Because it attaches itself to a weak place. Just like if a person gets a cut, you get a cut in your hand. That means that that place can very easily become infected. Very easily. It's a vulnerability. And that's why these are all interconnected. And the prophets of Israel conveyed this. They knew that man struggles with this issue. Feeling that man can't come close to God. God's too remote. That's what Isaiah says in chapter 55, that when you find Hashem, you should seek him. Very a weird statement, don't you think? You should seek God when you find Now, you can ask the question, why would the Navi say, Dear Shu Hashem, Behim Matzai, seek God when you found him? You found him, what do you have to seek him for? You seek something you didn't find. I can't find it. Keep looking. No, Isaiah says, seek Hashem when you found him. What does it mean? That means have a connection to him. Karuhu be Yosei Karev, scream out to him when he's close. Why am I screaming if he's close? You understand? All the prophets recognize that this is a very dangerous thing. Why do we think that God won't forgive us? and we feel that God is remote, because there are people who have heard us that we haven't forgiven. I'm sure there are people that have hurt you in your life, that betrayed you in your life. They were probably people very close to you, and you don't forgive them. You won't talk to your brother anymore. You haven't spoken to your sister in years. And your sister is still, to this day, your chief adversary. Your best friend from high school. You'll never talk to her again. So because we can be... um, Our ability to forgive is injured, we create God in our image. That's what Christianity is. We create God in our image. That's so dangerous. Hashem says, I'm not a man. Stop it. Don't create me in your image. See, Judaism, the faith of Israel, is God's successful endeavor in creating man in his image. Christianity is a failed effort of man to create God in his image. That's why Jesus has to be human. And he has to be very handsome, very perfect, sinless, born of a virgin, perfect. That's how we imagine. Jesus, you can't have a short, fat, bald. If you're short, fat, bald, don't be angry at me. He, he, he's got to look great. He's got to be. So I, the, so I would say this to you, to call out HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and with assurance that he loves you much more than you can ever love him. He loves you much more than you can ever hope to love him. And therefore, it's counterintuitive. You are in control of the relationship between you and God because in Jewish thinking, when you have a relationship, whoever is the lesser of the two in the relationship controls the nature of the relationship. If... if If I like you and you love me, so I control. We have a like relationship. So because our love for Hashem could never exceed the love that Hashem has for us, so therefore, we are in control of it. Now, if you think I'm maybe, this sounds like a nice homily that a rabbi gives from a a pulpit, make a big mistake. Isaiah says this. Openly, the next verse, verse fifty-seven, verse fifty-five, verse seven. If the wicked person forgets, for, 
abandons his ways, the sinful person his. I will surely forgive him. Why? Hashem says the next verse, look at 8 and 9. For my ways are higher than your ways. Your th- my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. The heavens are higher than the earth. So too are my ways higher than your ways. My, you know, I've debated Christians. You want to hear chutzpah? It's on YouTube. But I've debated Christians, let's say, over the doctrine of the Trinity. And they actually, when the text in verse 8 and 9 says, God says, my ways are higher than your ways. What does God mean? He means that even though you have trouble forgiving, I will forgive you. I'll be close to you. Just, I'm here. They actually use it to defend the Doctrine of Trinity, which is completely ridiculously irrational. And they use this passage completely out of context. So you should know this, that you should turn to HaKosh Baruch Hu and say, I love you. And rest assured that he loves you more than you'll ever love him. Ask HaKajibar for wisdom, never doctrine, and say, I want to be close to you. Okay? And the world was created for men, not the other way around. There are no forces that you cannot control. And you, sir, remain in my prayers. And as I said, I'm very envious of you. But you have to remember this. There's, there are, when people leave Christianity or religions like it, it usually happens in stages. First, they realize that it's mistaken because they see that it's inconsistent, incompatible with Tanakh. Worse, it's scandalous. So it's a cognitively. But then... There's a usually a second stage where emotionally a person realizes that it really is very toxic. And you have to get to that second stage. And you only could do that with the wisdom that HaKosh Baruch will give you, and you should devote your mind to studying these holy books of Tanakh so that you can become close to Hashem. You, sir, are in my prayers. Thank you. Antonio, you're live on the air. Go ahead with your question. Okay, thank you. And Shana Tova, and Gamar Tatima Tova, Rabbi. Thank you. Um, my question is about the book of John, chapter 20. A very famous apologist, Dr. William Lane Craig, argues that in John 20, 28, when the doubting Thomas, after seeing the risen Jesus, says, my Lord and my God. He says that he's calling Jesus Lord and God properly in a way that is unique from the Hebraic tradition in the Hebrew Bible. But my question is, um, when you translate this phrase into the Hebrew, atuni ve'elahai, how is it possible to know then that the Doubting Thomas is actually referring to Jesus as the one God, the Father. Right. So that's just a great point. You're really a smart young man. You can go ahead and hand uh, me on to if you answer. Thank you for calling in. Thank you. Yeah. Rabbi. Thank you. And I, I want you to know that this is the best stuff they have. <laughs> Not kidding. Because the the doctrine of the Trinity, now, there's no doctrine of the Trinity in the New Testament. I mean, forget that. Doctrine of the Trinity is a, a later development. I'm not just talking about the word Trinity. But the, the he, he's using this passage, which is unique to John. About 90% of the book of John appears nowhere in the other three Gospels, including the story of of the Doubting Thomas. And, right, so in the text, it's, you know, Thomas who, you know, doubted, you know, he able to put his finger and see that Jesus physically rose. The, the story is the, is the, the last, it's really the end of the book of John. John 20 is really the last chapter. John 21 is almost certainly a later accretion, a later 
added on again. So right, so he said, my God, my Lord. And so that means nothing. And he's saying that's a proof. It's so crazy. You know, Craig, he's a very smart man. I've debated him. I've even debated him on Christian television. And this is the best stuff he can come up with. When I debated him, I said to him, the doctrine of Trinity is nowhere found in the Hebrew Bible, and he was honest enough to admit that it isn't anywhere in the Hebrew Bible. So you're right. So this is the best they have. And as I say, when Thomas said, my Lord, my God, doesn't mean he's saying you are God. And not only that, the book of John is very clear that Jesus is not God. He is not omnipotent, which means all-powerful. Openly in John chapter 5, we are told, I mean, this is the author of John. I'm telling you, 21 is written by somebody else, almost for sure. But in in the same book, Jesus openly says, or the Joannian Jesus openly says, that I can do nothing of my own, but only of the one who sent me. Do you know that the longest dialogue, the longest dialogue in all the Christian Bible, by far, is in the book of John? And who is the dialogue between? It's a big dialogue between Jesus talking to God and praying and asking for things. Goes on for chapters. 17, 18, 19. It's chapter. What am I talking about? 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, five chapters. That's the called the farewell discourse. And he's asking God that that the disciples should be one as we are one. I mean, it goes on and on. It's so in context, the Jesus of the fourth gospel, and it's important to note that the fourth gospel contains the highest Christology found in anywhere in the Christian Bible. Certainly much higher than what we have in... So if, if, if Jesus can't do anything of his own, that means the central feature, identifying feature of God is he is all-powerful. He's all-powerful. And Jesus admits that I can do nothing on my own, but only of the one who sent me. What do you need, really? Like, like what do you need? That means all this doctrine of the Trinity, the hypostatic union, this is all a very late development. And in fact, the church fathers who invented the word Trinity, like Tertullian, they didn't believe in the doctrine of the Trinity as it was hammered out in Nicaea. It was a point in time where the Father existed and the Son did not. I mean, just look at John 5.30. So this is what's called an, an iso Jesus. It's the most dangerous, most dangerous approach to interpreting text. Most dangerous thing you could do. An eisegesis means that you, as opposed to an exegesis, an eisegesis means that you take a passage or a part of a passage and you remove it, you extract it from its context, you're gone. You're gone. And that's what's happening here. And as I said, if Jesus is saying you are the only true God, this is eternal life. This is John 17 already. This is eternal life. They may know you, the only true God, only. The Greek word is manos. That's a Greek word. Only means that no one else. And Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. I can do nothing. If I bear testimony of myself, that testimony is nothing. What does that mean? That's John 5. John 8. Look, let, let me, let me, I want to just do this with you because you, you, you kind of asked the question, but you know the answer. I want to explain how 
healthy hermeneutics works. I mean, you look at any ancient text, you want to know, what am I reading? Either a text you believe in or you don't believe in, whatever, but what's going on? What was the intent of the author? So in any kind of putative holy book, there are going to be texts that are very clear and other passages that are nebulous, that are not exactly clear. Okay, Listen, if you just learn this, it's worth tuning in for the show. The This is like the laws of thermodynamics. I mean, everything we know about relies on the, it's this immutable. What happens is you always have, in any book that's important, let's go just say a supposed holy book, you have passages that are very clear of what is intended, and then you have other passages which are not completely clear. They're not completely clear. It could, there's a number of you. So what you always do, if you want to say just what did the... Somebody wrote the book of John. I'm not going to why, but whoever authored the book of John not only wasn't John, but actually says he's not John. I'm not going into, but it's actually in this region that we can see that at the end of John. But whoever wrote it, we want to know what did he, was he thinking. So the, the, the fundamental rule of hermeneutics is we recognize there are passages that are very clear, very clear, and we have some passages that are a little ambiguous. This is not really ambiguous. This is just force, but let's just call it ambiguous. You could say it's ambiguous. So you always use passages that are in the light to interpret passages that are in the dark. And if you ever encounter a cult, they're always reversing it. Their focus, they're zooming in on ambiguous verses and using that eisegesis, that their spin on a nebulous a, a passage in the dark to reinterpret explicit passages. They all do this. They do this with the Trinity interpreting Tanakh. Of course, there are some verses in Tanakh that are a little hard to understand. There are plenty of verses that are Most of it is very easy. But there are some verses that are not so simple. You really have to know the context. You really have to understand what's going on. But that's the game. So you're right. So I, I rather than go into the obvious... Now, the reason why I'm, I should footnote this, is I think I'd be remiss, is the reason why the story of Downing Thomas is there is one for the obvious, because Jesus then goes on to say, you saw and believed, blessed are those who didn't see, who didn't, and they believe anyway. So you can, you can see the takeaway there. But also, the story of Downing Thomas is there as a pushback against Paul's view. It, it is as you look at the Gospels in chronological order, there's a pushback against 1 Corinthians 15, which means that in Paul's view is really a Neoplatonic view of the resurrection, which means that the resurrected body was a spiritual body. It's not a mortal body. It's not a regular, it's not the body that died. It's something else. It's a body, but it's a spiritual thing. Paul wins and that he is the most influential author by far, he, he created Christianity. He is the author of Christianity. But Paul was using the Greek view that the physical body doesn't resurrect itself. The, that view falls out of favor really quickly. So the Gospels are already abandoning it. Now Mark ends with 16 verse 8. So there's, well, there at least there's an empty tomb. Paul doesn't mention an empty tomb. But then you have, let's just say, go to Luke. So Jesus is already eating with the disciples in a room in Jerusalem and is making the point, how is it that a, could a spirit eat burnt fish and drink? No. And this is saying, aha, further, it's a real physical, full-blown resurrection. That's why the story is there. It's there for a number of reasons, but that's the big takeaway. Anyway, it's very, very, very good. But now you understand how to examine text. You look at the clear text. So in the case of the Book of John, we know what, what it, whoever, somebody wrote this book at the very end of the first century of a highly literate Christian. 
All right. What was he thinking? Okay. Thank you for your question. Very cool. Okay, moving in with our next caller, uh, Miss Phoenix, you are live on the air. Go ahead with your question. Thank you. Shalom, Rabbi. Rafu uh, Shlema for your father. Uh, you. May he live his full 120 years and his Amen. strength not be abated and his eye not grow dim, just like Moshe Rabbeinu. Amen. And the same for your wife. Thank the you. same for your wife, William. Um, my question today actually has to do with someone uh, who called in earlier. You were talking about demons, and um, that was a question. I've actually been thinking about this recently. I don't know why, but it was a question I always had, even back in my church days, because um, according to church theology, Satan is, and his demons are basically about as powerful as God. You know, Paul talked about how um, you know he tried to make plans, and Satan was always thwarting him. Yeah, and, Satan. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so it's like what you're saying, you know, and part of the reason they believe that all these other religions, you know, the like the mystery religions and all that stuff existed was because Satan and the demons knew ahead of time what God's plan was. And, and he was, they, they were trying to keep people from believing in the, the real supposed savior when he came along by creating all these things ahead of time that looked just like what the church was going to look like. So, you know, I, I never understood that because what you're saying is that Satan and the demons, these created beings and ones that supposedly are evil, no less, somehow know and understand the mind of God. So my question basically is, are demons real? And if so, what are they really? Because they, they can't be fallen angels, because how could a, a being that is created, that lives in the presence of God, how could that, you know, who, who knows what, who and what God is, how could that kind of being actually rebel against God? So, so if, are demons real? And if so, what are they okay. really? That's awesome. basically my question. Great question. Thank you so much for your call. Go ahead and hang up now to your answer. Thank you. Rabbi. I'm really so blessed to have you call in with such a thoughtful question. You have to thank Hashem every day that he created Satan and created demons. You thank Hashem for it. Nothing can go into rebellion against God. No angel, none. This is all dualistic nonsense. It's very much... It, the idea that Satan is an independent agent is in the Christian Bible, for sure. Paul in 2 Corinthians 4.4 4, calls the devil the lord of this world, which is highly dualistic and would find itself well at home in Zoroastrianism, a ancient, not as ancient as Lahavdal uh, Moshe Rabbeinu, but would, it's, it's, would find itself at home in Zoroastrianism, a, a dualistic religion of a god of light and darkness. Satan, Satan is a blessing from HaKadosh Baruch Hu. He was created for the purpose of casting forth blandishments, seducing men away from God, so that virtue is possible. That's all. If there was no Satan in the world, you have to listen very carefully, you daughter of Hashem. You were created in the image of, of God, you know that. You're holy. You have a neshama. You have a chelik bimal mamish. It means the, the, a divine spark resides in you. And therefore, if there was no Satan in the world, I'll talk about demons in a moment, you would never want to sin. Never. It would be stupid. It would be like walking into your kitchen and you see there's a fire. You have a stove. There's a fire. You would never stick your hand in the fire because why? Can you? Theoretically, you can, of course, but you wouldn't. Why not? Because you understand the consequences. You you would be very careful, right? So that's what the world would be like without Satan. We would immediately recognize good from evil what is sweet from what is bitter, immediately. But the problem is there would be no free will. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, I had to create darkness, and I created evil. Yoytzar uvarei chashech oisisham uvarei ra, Isaiah 45, verse 7. Ani Hashem oisachol eile. I, the Lord, created it all. Do you hear that? 
Isaiah 45, verse 7. And you should know this is an attack on Zoroastrianism. Where do I come off saying that? Because this is the same chapter. Now, those of you who study with me know exactly what Isaiah 45 is very famous for, and that is we're introduced to Cyrus, who doesn't know God's name. But he got, Isaiah says nearly two centuries before Cyrus that there's going to be a man, Cyrus, and he's God's anointed, and he's going to tell the Jews, go back to Israel and rebuild the temple. But don't think this amazing person who's doing unbelievable things for the Jews is a perfect guy. He's not. And don't question me. That's a very big section of Isaiah 45 is don't question my ways. We see today very unusual people are doing amazing things in the world, and they come from places that we would never dream that God would use such people in order to bring about such a redemption, or so, to be a part, and they're just people in a million years, you wouldn't dream that th a person like this should be involved in such a holy thing? Why does God use that? Don't question what I'm doing. And Cyrus almost surely was a Zoroastrian. Okay? That's why it's there, really. The reason why 45.7 is there. Hashem openly says in, in, in Deuteronomy 30, before you I place uh, good in life, evil, and I put it there. Hashem says it. So Satan was created in order to cast forth blandishments. And he knows exactly how to test you of where you can overcome it. And he's rooting for you in Jewish thought. He's, he really, there is a stream, I should say there's a stream of thinking that he's really, he knows what his job is, but he's hoping you'll pass the test. You know? Okay, so that... It's so crazy, it's so contradictory, because on the one hand, the people who subscribe to Reform theology, w w how do they excuse Calvinism, which is crazy, that God chose before you were born for anything, if you're going to go to heaven, go to hell, if you're going to be a Christian, huh? So they argue that there's com God has complete sovereignty. That's the, if you go to any Calvinist, and there are many of you watching me now who were Calvinists or who know your stuff, you know I'm not straw manning this, I'm steel manning this. So on the one hand, when it's convenient, they say God is sovereign, he could do what he wants. He's sovereign. Now, if you're a theist, if you're a believer, so it's very attractive that God's sovereign. Of course he's sovereign. He has to be um, omniscient and omnipotent, all-knowing and all-powerful, of course immutable, of course. It's very attractive, but they're using an attractive word to really sell you something that's poison. So that's why Sutton was created. Sutton was created so that you have free will. That's it. Now, this is not in the Christian Bible because the Christian, Christianity really is seeking to synchronize idolatry, the, the mystery religion. What, what does that even mean? And it's, it's, it's all baked in dualism. It's all over the New Testament. It means that this world's really a bad place. I told you, 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, Satan is the lord of this world. Why would people find that attractive? Because this world is full of death and misery and suffering. I remember once I had an ailment, which the doctor was able to do one procedure, and I was healed. And I asked the doctor, what did people do 100 years ago? I'll never forget it. And the doctor said to me, they suffered. People, what do they do in the 19th century? They didn't have the technology. Or the, those are the, people lived miserably. <laughs> really. So, so that's, what, that's what Sutton is. Sutton is doing the work of Hashem. And Sutton, and, and you, by the way, Satan appears in Tanakh very rarely, very rarely. And that's valuable because we we have very specific instances where Satan appears, like in the book of Job. Satan comes before God, and he says, you know, he says, there's a man here who's, 
he's a righteous man for sure, but if maybe he wasn't so wealthy and so successful, both in his personal life and in his financial life, he might curse you. And God said to Satan, okay, this is what you can do, this is what you can't do. And Satan does exactly what God tells him to. Does that sound like an angel in rebellion? How foolish, how silly. But in, in the ancient world, people just didn't understand because they didn't, you know, they, and people died of their teeth because they didn't, they didn't understand microbiology and all the infections. People died young for, they didn't understand what was going on. So, of course, you, now what are demons? I can't, this is what you need to know. Okay, and, and I'm not saying that in some sort of thing. It's because this is the metaphysical world. Okay, so we have to. I'm gonna. I want to make this very simple, but I and I do not want to um, convey that I understand the metaphysical way world that I I don't, but I do, and so do you. Listen. There's holiness in this world. People, when you look at a person's face, you look in some way, you're looking at a reflection of Hashem. Every person is creating the image of God. If you look at a, a cat, a mouse, a rabbit, not there. And that's why no animal ever believed in God. And if you can talk to a dog he, and you try to explain to him as a God, he wouldn't even know what you're talking about. He's not creating the image of God. I know you know your dog is different, but that's how it goes. There are, moreover, and this is where I want you to listen very carefully. There are tremendous sparks of kedusha, of holiness in the world. And you, in your life, at a certain moment, at a certain time, encountered it, felt that numinous experience of the presence of Hashem. So there are sparks of holiness in this world. This whole world was created by Akosh Baruch Hu because out of a an act of complete love. So imagine this world is full of sparks of kedusha of holiness. Now you may say that's great, but there's a problem. What's the problem? Bechira chafshi free will. Remember we said you, you free will is only possible. Loving Hashem is possible, or Change, I want to change that word possible to attainable if you can also reject a relationship with God. Do you follow? If the world only had sparks of holiness, see, we are entering the metaphysical way, but you're watching this. You know what I'm talking about. The awareness that the hand of God is here. Now, I confess to you, I live in Yerushalayim, Very holy place. You go to the grocery store, you could feel. I mean, I, I live where the prophets preached and wrote most of the Tanakh. It's a very holy place. Jerusalem has really no natural resources, no oceans, nothing. People come here from all over the world. In the middle of a war, they're here. You can't get a flight to Israel. You can't. The, the El Al is packed. They plane and they can't. All right, now. You now understand where this is going because it's related to the same thing. What would happen if there was only sparks of kedusha of holiness in the world? Whatever that means, because this is the this is the metaphysical. But let's say that was it. That would be a problem. What's the problem? By now you should know, and that is that we would lose our free will, or our free will would be injured. So just as there are sparks or forces of holiness all about us, there must be something to offset that. Just like the air we breathe is a very delicate balance of oxygen, 21% about there, nitrogen, about 78%, and other sorted gases out there. And it's a very perfect balance. Everything's on a knife's edge. You know, just like the 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 powerful um, positive forces, negative forces, it's on a knife's edge. So in the spiritual world too, there has to be a perfect, perfect balance of not just um, forces that pull, but also a, a very weak force in the world that pushes away. 
It's really mind blowing. And if it, I'm not a physicist, but from what physicists tell me, that if if these forces in the world would be changed, even what the world, the universe couldn't exist. In the same way as a spiritual world, that if there was too much sparks of kedusha, without we call them demons, you call it whatever you want, but they're negative dark forces in the world, they are designed exactly perfectly for your good, that you can overcome it. How could you overcome it? Turn to the Torah, turn to Hashem. Don't ever, ever ask for doctrine and the truth through prayer. Never do that. You'll wind up in problems. Tanakh is doctrine, but you pray for wisdom. You pray for a close relationship with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. So, I, I can't tell you what a demon is, but whatever it is, it is there is present in the world, so to offset the holiness in the world, so that you have complete free will. And as such, if you turn to Hakadosh Baruch Hu and love Him, and reject these other forces, so then you're virtuous, then you're a tzaddik, then you're a person that has attained the great levels that Noach was able to attain. In his lifetime, in his wicked generation, Avraham Avinu was alone in the world. So that's what that's what Sutton is, and demons are Baruch Hashem. Thank God for Sutton and for demons. Whatever, because without that, there will be no virtue in the world. And Hashem promises you, I I created it. It's all from me. And he dafka. I don't think I ever said this on air. He deliberately sticks this in Isaiah 45 verse 7. Why? Because the chapter originated with introducing us to Cyrus, who almost surely was a Zoroastrian, which is a oil ancient Persian religion, which is still around. They claim now, I know I'm going to get hate letters on this, but there'll be Zoroastrians who are going to write to me and say, well, really, monotheism. Forget that. It's a real, real dualism. <laughs> and that's a direct swipe at it. Anyways, God bless you. Have a happy, healthy new year. Very nice. All right. We are, well, we still got time. Okay, cool. We have plenty of time. All right, good deal. Next caller, Mr. Joseph, you're live on the air. Go ahead with your question. Shalom, Rabbi and William. Um, prayers for both your father and your wife, uh, that they would have a full recovery and that everyone would be comforted. Thank you. Um, my question is, I've, I've recently encountered an ideation of Christianity that kind of... Uh, it doesn't believe in the serious atonement. It doesn't believe in Jesus' sacrifice for sin. It believes his sacrifice was to remove the curse of death and the idea of um, basically like it goes like, oh, it removes the curse of death. You still have to repent. There is no atonement for sin through the sacrifice, but the removal of the death curse will allow you to be resurrected and that kind of idea if you're not resurrected than they believe in annihilationism kind of thing. And so I'm wondering if there's anything even remotely resembling annihilationism in Tanakh and this idea of a death curse. Like, I understand if you, the soul that sin shall surely die, but what is the understanding, the Jewish understanding of that compared to this new doctrine that I've encountered? Hmm. Everybody okay. clear? Yeah, I I think I I know what you're talking about. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I I believe what you're saying is. Okay, let let me just answer the question. Okay. Hey, Steve, go ahead and hang up. I'm sorry, Joseph. Go ahead and hang up now too, if you answer. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right, Rabbi, take it away. So I first telling you that I'm not a hundred percent because you were saying different things and I wasn't clear. But I, I think you are describing a theology found in in Luke's writings. 
So we don't know who wrote the third gospel, but we do know that whoever wrote the third gospel, who's called Luke, also is the author of the book of Acts. There are many reasons we know that, but we really could, that's one of the things we do know. And in that view, in the view of the third gospel, which is very distinct from the other three gospels, Jesus did not die as a ransom for our sins. Means the author of Luke did not believe in vicarious atonement, as you said, but rather, if you think about Jesus' death, you will repent, and it's the repentance that will afford you a forgiveness for your sins. I don't want to get complicated with you, but it's and this is stated openly, incidentally. So again, as far as Luke is concerned, Jesus' death is really important, but it's not important in the way it is, for example, in Matthew and Mark or in Paul's letters. In 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 Matthew and Mark, as as an example, um, they both state that Jesus died as a ransom for your sins. Matthew 20, verse 28. Mark chapter 10, verse 45. Okay. Luke will have no part of that. And therefore, its corresponding text does not appear in Luke, which is very intriguing because really Matthew and Luke are both using almost all the book of Mark as a source. Oh, both of them almost they copy the entire book of Mark in very often verbatim. But that Luke would dismiss this is really quite striking. So in Luke's view, Jesus' death is important. Now, Luke is also very in interested in death in general, martyrdom in general. And Luke certainly wanted Christians to know how to die for their religion. That was a big deal for Luke. But the key is Acts 3.19 Repent and turn back, and your sins will be blotted out. Okay? That is the that is the Christology of Luke, and it is not shared by the other gospel writers. In fact, scribes would alter Luke 22, 19, where you find the, the Eucharist, and interpolate part of verse 19 of chapter 22, and all of 20, verse 22, where it says, take this, uh, it, Luke has it the other way, take this wine, this is provided for you, this is for the blood for your sins, the bread, this is the body of Jesus for your sins. That's a later interpolation. So it's very intriguing that later scribes corrupted Luke 22, so that it seems similar, it does, it, I mean, it does seem similar to the uh, Eucharist found in the other Gospels. Now, as it turns out, Luke's view is more carefully copied from Judaism, which means, and this is the spin that connects your question, there is a, a very much a concept in Tanakh that if you see someone who's a good person die and you take it to heart, it'll cause you to do to repent, or it can bring about a repentance. Example, Yoshio, Josiah, who is the last of the great Davidic kings. He was really a very great man great man. He tragically died young. He was in his 30s. And he, he, he was, he put on battle gear and went to war with his soldiers and an Egyptian archer killed him, not knowing that he was the king and they carried him away. He died and the whole nation cried about him and repented and actually forestalled the destruction of the first temple. This happened during the lifetime of Jeremiah. 
So it, it can, before God brings about punishment, God hopes that you would look at suffering. And I'll tell you this, there are many people who only when they lose someone they love, there are many people that observe what happened on October 7th. There are many people who observe what happened during World War II. And Jewish suffering causes people to repent of tshuva. Not kidding. It's an amazing thing. And Isaiah actually says this quite explicitly. Now, Isaiah 57 is a... Much of Isaiah is enormous criticism, and God's really angry. And that's how the chapter begins. That a tzaddik is gone, dies, and no one takes it hard. You know, before the Holocaust, there were many, many great rabbis who died. You know, the Chafetz Chaim, very famous, died right before he died in 1933. The Rogachever died. Many of them died. And people really should say, wow. Now, the Chafetz Chaim, who's a great, 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 great rabbi, he was an old, old man. I think he was 98 when he died. So it wasn't like some just tragedy. Like he didn't, he died. And people should say, oh, that's how he dies. So Isaiah, you'll see here, it says that Isaiah 37 begins with this concept that the righteous person suffers and look at you and no one takes it to heart. No one thinks about it. And that's like the lowest blow. That means you see suffering around you. Now, those people suffer or die for whatever they read. They're not dying for your sins. But when you see tragedy and you see a an Odom kosher, a kosher Jew, or a kosher person, I won't say Jew, Odom kosher, just means a kosher person, a person who's a upright person die, you take it to heart. And if you take it to heart, when a righteous person suffers or dies, it causes you to repent immediately. It causes you, and that will bring about your repentance. So Luke, no doubt, is aware of this, and he is borrowing this and applying it. So yes, it is found in one Christology in the Christian Bible, and that's the Christology of Luke. And it is presumably borrowed directly from Tanakh and from Judaism. Now, now, as you can well imagine, our good friends in the church, all the missionaries, misappropriate these texts. These texts don't mean that a person dies vicariously for your sins. That's, that's Matthew's view. That's Paul's view. That's Mark's view. It's not, that's garbage. Human sacrifice is a horrible sinful thing. But um, Luke, I can't say no doubt, but Luke is mimicking this kind of thinking. Okay? Thank you so much for your question. Okay, let's move to what is this number here? 3085. Okay. Mr. Mark, you are live on the air. Go ahead with your question. Okay, thank you. Um, Thanks for hearing me. I I wanted to ask um, about dualism a little bit more. Um, I'm burdened by the scripture in the New Testament that says, love not the world or anything of the world or the love of the Father is not in you. That led me on to a, a path of Gnosticism. I'm sure you've heard of Gnosticism and all of its things. And that goes back to the Garden of Eden. And so... Can you maybe help enlighten me on where maybe some of this comes from and the purpose of the serpent? Because if, you know, Hashem, it says, you know, Hero Israel, our God is one, our Lord is one. So I understand that there has to be one originating entity. And it's just one, it all exists as one. But what was the purpose of the, the serpent, if there was a purpose? Okay. So those are two, thank you. Those are two questions. Go ahead, go ahead and hang up now and tune in for your answer. Thank you. Okay. 
But those are really two different subjects. Gnosticism, which is very important when understanding what fueled New Testament writers. Now, don't confuse it with Christian Gnosticism, which emerges in the second century. Just don't do that. Gnosticism is a dualism. You hear this come up a lot because at that time, dualism infected everything, infected almost every religion, not only in the Levant, but well beyond. Gnosticism is always pagan, always. All Gnostics are pagans. But essentially, Gnosticism viewed this world as an evil place. Um, this whole world is just evil, bad. And it's easy to understand why this made sense. I mean, if modern medicine didn't exist, would you, would you and the people you love be alive today? Maybe not, right? It was, the world was a place of inexplicable suffering. It made no sense. Conversely, when you looked up at the sky, the night sky, now, most people today live in the city. Light pollution, you can't see the sky. And we don't need the sky, meaning, I will just retract that and restate this, we do not need to understand the stars and the celestial bodies and how they work to guide us which way is north and what season. We don't need any of that. Why? We can go on a computer, go on a cell phone. We don't need it. If you live in a city, you can't see it anyway because it's light all over the place. But in the ancient world, they really, people really had a better understanding of the, the celestial movements and everything was perfect. Imagine how different this is. The, the celestial world, you could predict where all the stars would be at a certain time of the year. And around you, nothing was explicable. Broken bodies and broken wheels and there was no reason. A man married, marries a nice, beautiful, healthy girl, and three months later, she's dead. I don't, what the heck happened to her? They didn't know. They didn't understand any of this. It was just, you know, if you read biographies of people, whether it's people who lived relatively recently, even, let's say, in the time of Mozart. I remember reading the biography. He says, I, I don't remember. I think his mother had, I don't know how many children he, his mother had. Was it five, six, seven, whatever? She had a bunch of kids, but only a few of them made it to adulthood. I don't know, two or three. And that was normal. Death was ubiquitous. Okay. So in the ancient world, this world was a bad place. This is the Manichaeism of Augustine. He, and the select, this world is a place to just get away from, to escape. How can I get away from this? How can I be in the celestial part of a celestial world that's perfect? This world is real Neoplatonic thinking. This world was created by a god, but a lower tier god, a, a demiurge. Because look at it, it's a nightmare. The lord of this world is the devil, it's something, and the whole purpose is to get away from it. That's why celibacy or things like celibacy was so pre prevailed so much you know like you know augustine thought that all right if you get married you want to have children of course you sleep with your spouse but once you're done um having children there's there's no reason to be intimate with your with your spouse he saw that all as lower. In the thinking of the Orthodox Church is that, and among many different Christian sects, is that when Mary was born, her parents, now according to 
all Christian denominations, Mary was not supernaturally conceived, like to a virgin, any, none of that. Um, but uh, it is widely viewed in the Orthodox Church that they had no pleasure, that means Mary's mother, Anna, had no pleasure at all in having sex with her husband when Mary was conceived. The Catholic Church goes on to, to teach the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception, which is not a virgin birth. It means that she was born without the stain of original sin. I don't want to go off topic, but you understand that kind of view is all entangled together. Do you understand? That this is all over the Christian Bible. This, and that's and the key in Gnosticism, this develops very strong in the second century, is if you're on a world that's a bad place, that was created by a god but a lower god, how do you escape? How do you get to the good place, right? So you had to have information, knowledge. You had to have the – to untangle the mystery of this world so you can escape it. And this Paul talks about this openly. Read Ephesians chapter three, and Paul openly says that this, everything in this world is a big secret, and he has that revelation. And he says that if the leaders of the generation of Jesus would have only know the secrets of this, these secrets, that's what gnosis means. It means knowledge. That means, what does this mean? What does knowledge have to do with anything? It means this world's a horrible place, a sinful place, a corrupt place, just a filthy place. But how do you, what's your ticket to heaven? That you have the secret knowledge that only Paul provides. That's why this word mystery is all over Paul's letters. Ah, missionaries claim it's open in Isaiah 53, it's open in the Daniel line. Paul didn't care about any of that. He says there's a big mystery and no one knew it. There are, mamish, there are missionaries who claim that the whole Christian salvation program was a complete mystery. Nobody knew it but Paul. Paul makes that claim. These missionaries are not. This is all in that dark theological jungle. It's all interconnected. Okay, you got all that? So... Gnosis means knowledge was your ticket to escape the, this world by knowing who you are, where you come from, and how to get out of here. You have to have the secret knowledge. And Paul is claiming in his letters he has that secret knowledge, and he got it directly from Jesus Christ. He did not have to rely on Jerusalem for it. This is all over Paul's letters. That's why when we see where the book of Acts deviates from Paul's letters— it is there are a number of reasons or there are a number of deviations between Paul's letters and the book of Acts. The the most striking one is how frequently did Paul visit Jerusalem. In Acts he was going back and forth and bring sacrifices and circumcising Timothy. Paul eh, spent a couple of weeks, you see, at the beginning of Galatians. And you know, he met the disciples, the so-called pillars of the church. You understand? It's a mystery. That's what's important. So that's where that's where this term mystery religion comes from. The occult. What does that mean? Those things that are hidden. What does it mean hidden? That's what's going on. Now, you're talking about the serpent in the Garden of Eden. It's not really connected. It's not connected to Gnosticism. I'll just give you ver something very quickly. So in order to understand the serpent in the Garden of Eden, which is we're introduced to the Nochosh in Genesis 3, verse 1, it seems inexplicable of what is the motive of this character. The serpent is trying to persuade Eve to eat from the tree of knowledge, but it's not a Gnostic thing at all. In very simple, that the serpent was unique in the world in that we're told in the tire that it was very wise. It was the most, uh, of all the beasts in the field, it was the most wise. It had, it can walk, it had legs. 
It could talk. Walk, talk, and intelligent? What does that make you think of? And it was a connoisseur of good food, which it lost when it was cursed. It, the, the nachosh, it's a beast, seems almost human. But why, why is this character there? I know people say it's Satan, it's the devil, but we need to get more sophisticated. So I'm just giving you the one-minute version of this, and that is that Adam, right before this in chapter 2, was shown all the beasts in the field to see which one was a possible soulmate for a wife. Adam saw that there's no animal that was appropriate for him. And he was felt bad, and HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave him a wife, right? Which Of which animals would have felt, boy, he really dumped me. It would have been the walking, talking, thinking, fine-tasting creature that's almost human. And the argument the Nachash is making, the serpent is making is, this is not how it says, but I'm just paraphrasing. What's happening there is the Nachash is saying, no, the serpent would seem to be almost human, have the qualities that a human being would have, sentient, not just as an animal, almost as a human being. In other words, saying the way we operate in the animal kingdom is we do not listen to the voice of God. We operate by instincts. And um, unfortunately, Chavo um, um, listened to him and followed instincts. Remember, she saw the fruit. She saw it was, it was tasty, and so on. So, so the but getting back, the Gnosticism is all over the place. In especially in Paul's letters, it's really everywhere. But it's just very strong in Paul's letters because that's after all where Christian theology is found in the letters of Paul rather than the Gospels. Thank you for your question. All right, looks like we got time for one more. I believe let's squeeze this baby in. All right, caller, you. There we go. Okay, you're live on the air. Go with the question. Tell us your name again. Right on. Oh, yeah, right on. There you go. Okay, go ahead with the question. Uh, uh Rabbi. Thank you. I just wanted to, uh, I hope you had a good fast. Uh, it was a tough day for me, but I made it. But, uh, uh, I had a couple of questions. I have plenty for you on Genesis 3, but uh, I'll hold those off for another day. Um, really wanted to know more about John 3.16, where it says that uh, for God gave his, uh, so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. And I was looking in the Greek, and it says the word is monogenous. And in the King James, it's only begotten son. In NIV and other translations, it's one and only son. And I think that makes a big difference when we consider that at places like the Council of Nicaea, they were saying that uh, Jesus and God are one and the same, and therefore um, he was not created by God. And I say if, if he was begotten, then Jesus had to follow God. Uh, and even if we look in John 1, 14, it also uses that same or a very similar Greek term, and uh, it says only begotten there. And so I kind of wanted to know what the correct Greek is, but my theory is, again, if the NIV and all those are correct, then Jesus is not God. If Even if the King James is correct, then it still doesn't make sense, because how, do, um, how does Jesus get enough chromosomes from his mom unless she was one of these lizards that can do parthogenesis and clone herself into her son. So um, so I see a falsehood there just in that verse. I wanted your opinion on that. So, you know, thank you. As it turns out, all the interlocutors at the Council of Nicaea in the summer of 325 believed that Jesus was the only begotten son. And to the surprise of many people, all the interlocutors who were present at this very influential um, church council 
believed that Jesus was divine. They all did, okay? There were... Um, <laughs> no one there thought that Jesus wasn't God. Now, this is very surprising because you probably wonder, well, what were they arguing about then? So we live in a world today where there really are only two possible choices. You can either be a theist and then you're a monotheist, or chas someone doesn't believe at all. But paganism can't exist today, meaning that there are many gods who are completely independent agents and that they're it's not tenable because we know the science. We know that we're all made of the same stuff. We're made of stardust. And God gathered the clay of the earth. And we now know more about that. We're just we're made up of this stuff that the stars are made of. So we know there's one, there's only one God. And that's why today I know that my Hindu viewers are going to be very, very angry with me. They get very disappointed in me because they like I, a lot of them like me, but they. But that's why Hindus today are reinterpreting their religion as a monotheism, and many brag that it's the oldest monotheism, older than Judaism. All right, we'll leave it. It's silly, to, but whatever. The so, even those who repre represented the view of Arius, who was a Christian thinker from Alexandria. You know, all avoidizer, all idolatry, all everything that's ungodly comes from Alexandria. Really. So he held that Jesus was divine, but he just wasn't as divine as the Father, meaning there was a point in time when only the Father exists and the Son did not exist. So the in the correction I would make here is that all the interlocutors at the Council of Nicaea believed that Jesus was begotten or, and the only begotten son, except that those who differed with the Bishop of Alexandria, whose name was Alexander, or differed with Athanasius, who would become later on become the Bishop of, Alexa of Alexandria, so, so according to this view that lost out, uh, Jesus was was begotten, God's only begotten Son. But um, there was a point in time the Father existed and the Son did not exist, so the Son was a created being. the The reason why Christianity is always fighting this issue, and they just can't get rid of it. They can't put out the fires because it's very simple. There's so many reasons for it. But one is in the Christian Bible, Jesus is very distinct from the Father and is not all-powerful, John 5.30. Is not all-knowing, Mark 13. He doesn't know when the time of the end is. Only the Father knows. If you're not all-knowing, you're not all-powerful, then you're not God. Those are the... Now, you can be a God in the Greco-Roman world, meaning you could be like a, a Pythagoras, like like um, Hercules, who these were gods, but they were mortals. They were not god like Jupiter and Zeus. They held, of course, Vespasian after he died, they held him to be a god as they did Octavius, but not, he wasn't Jupiter or Zeus, they think you're crazy. These were lower tier gods. So the, so the Council of Nicaea was not arguing over uh, John 3.16. Rather, they were questioning of how far does this go? Was there a point in time when the Father existed and the Son uh, did not exist, and therefore the Son is created. Now, this didn't just pop up in the 4th century. This argument is raging from the 2nd century on. I mean, Ignatius, a very early church father, in the very early 2nd century, said Jesus was God. But Ignatius did not have 
I don't believe, he was the Bishop of Antioch, the intellectual, the requisite intellectual sophistication to figure out some formula for this. Tertullian, the Latin church father from Carthage, North Africa, very influential, uh, converted to Christianity at the end of the second century. He did not believe that Jesus was the same as the father because in, he reasoned, he said, how, first of all, how could a father suffer? Now, one other point is you, you talked about a modalism, that they're all the same. That idea also pops up, the modalistic view. Even United Pentecostal Church today, uh, there's, they they believe in what is called Sibelianism, which means that there's not just one God, but there's one one person. There's not three persons. I'm, this is going to get too complicated, but modalism seeks to solve the problem of the Bible says that there's only one God. So how do you have three persons? So they reject it completely and say that just like I'm a father, I'm a brother, I'm a son, but I'm the same person. The problem, of course, with that is that Jesus can't be the same person because he's asking, take this cup, not of my will, but of your will, right? Well, they can't, if they're the same, who's he talking to? In a sense, they're very clearly distinct. This gets, this is probably not the show for it, but maybe on another show we can go deeper into this ever-developing doctrine of the Trinity and how it becomes more and more embellished with further and further accretions. But the point I want to convey is that all the interlocutors believe that Jesus was the only begotten son. Now, it will be very careful because, I mean, Adam is called the son of God in the New Testament. So whenever you hear fancy language, I want to retract the word fancy. Whenever you hear unconventional language, when Christians describe their religious beliefs, you know there's trouble. Why are we using terms like hypostatic union or hypostatic entities or persons? They're unconventional. So all these unconventional terms are there as a fig leaf to hide the problems and the, the, the lies of the church, frankly. So, uh he used a word that no one ever heard of. Who uses such words? Person. So these are philosophical terms in Greek thinking, but they're unconventional. So why use them? Why not use? Because there is no conventional language used to describe. What does that even mean? And I'll, I guess I'll take just one second further. The dog of the Trinity, what is this person? What's going on? So this is what develops. So you, the Christians are stuck with the with the Hebrew Bible, that there has to be one God. And it's in the New Testament too, there's only one God, right? But the question is, um, how is, like, why is the Father the Father and the Son the Son? Why isn't the Son the Father? Like, what, these words don't mean it. Like, what do they mean even if they're the same? So there are certain features of, I'm doing this way too fast, but in very simple terms, there's certain features, qualities that only God has. We talked about this all-powerful, all-knowing, unchanging. These are all, all properties that are unique to God alone, right? But are there properties that are unique to the Father in, Trini in this highly developed iteration of Trinitarianism? Are there properties that only the Son possesses but not the Father? So that would identify him as a separate person, you follow? This is why it's such a void of Zorro, you understand? Are there properties of the Holy Spirit that neither the Father or the Son have, follow? So in in this very, it's this takes centuries for the church to come up with this, because they're stuck. They're stuck with, well, Jesus is God, but how, what does that mean? If, if the Jesus is God and the Father is God, that's two God, but it can only be one. Do you follow? So, so what happens is that the Father ultimately is the monarch of the Trinity, and Jesus is not the monarch. He's the only begotten Son. That's where the begotten comes in. Follow? 
Jesus is the Word made flesh, John 1, 14. You quoted it. So, right? So there's a unique feature of Jesus that the Father does not have. You follow? You have to understand. That's, this is why, I'm, why am I doing this? I'm giving courses in idolatry. It's the worst thing. But you have to understand how dangerous this is. You know, you can't just hear that a cigarette has over 200 different carcinogens. You have to know what they are and why it kills you. And that the Holy Spirit is kind of the glue that pulls it all together. It's the comforter, the, the paraclete. You understand? So the, the, the doctrine of the Trinity is so dark because it says there's a common feature that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit have, which only God could have, as I said, all powerful, all knowing, immutable, and so on. Okay, but then the Father has to have a feature that the Son and the Holy Spirit doesn't have. This is where this is the big fight between the Orthodox Church and the Catholic Church. Because according to the Orthodox Church, the Father alone is the monarch. The, again, monarch. And the, therefore, the Holy Spirit was spirated. I have to use the fancy word because you have to, there's no other way. The, the, the Father alone spirated the Holy Spirit. Do you follow? Not the Son. Son is the Word. The filioque of the Roman Catholic Church, which the Orthodox hate, is saying that the Holy Spirit, the spiration of the Holy Spirit emerged from both the Father and the Son. But the Orthodox Church argues that in Cain, if that's the case, then you're, you're ruining the whole thing of three persons. And that's why the Orthodox Church considers Roman Catholicism a complete heresy. Do you understand? So you, it really is three persons and each one has a character feature that is not shared by the others. And then they have a common feature of the things that only God would have. And this is such a deep, dark of idolatry. Dark, dark idolatry that the church would... would I mean, when I say synchronize, I'm mean, sorry, italics, they're, they're taking that they're, well, monotheist is one God, but there are three persons. What is the three? Now, Protestants don't think about this. 99.9% .9 of the Protestants wouldn't even know what this is that hit them over the head. They don't know what person means. They don't know any of this. But the Orthodox Christians in particular are very sensitive to this. Now, what the Roman Catholic Church did, why they did it was because Augustine was experimenting with this idea. Augustine was a very, as I said, the most important, influential Western church father who lived in the 4th and 5th century. And he was very popular for many reasons. Uh, but uh, he, he wrote um, he, he, he wrote a lot. His confessions, many, work, many works. He was very influential. So he experimented with this kind of thinking as a way of pushing back against Arianism. And ultimately, the Catholic Church would adopt this in their Nicene Creed, the Filioque. Filioque means, I should translate that, means and the Son. Filios in Latin means Son, right? And que, the suffix, is and. So Filioque means and the Son. So according to the Catholic Church, the Holy Spirit was spirated from the Father and the Son. And that's how the Roman Catholics read it. The Orthodox Church says you just ruined everything. It's you, You're listening to this and you're going, I cannot believe what I'm hearing. Right? If you have any spiritual sensitivity at all, if Tyre has ever passed through your mouth, you look at a verse. It's so nice. Look, let's let's just wash ourselves from this filth for a moment. The Chebmia chapter nine verse six. Atahu Hashem levadecha, you alone are Lord. Isn't that nice? Isn't that feel good? You know, to just put away the cigarettes, put away the drugs, put it all away. 
אתה הוא השם לבדך. ואפס כמוני, there's no one like me, Isaiah 46. It's so delightful. Does it just wash you away? You know, when you, you're like, you ever been in a room, you know, and in, I know I'm going on here, but in Indonesia, people smoke a lot. There's a place they smoke because cigarettes are cheap and it's a big tobacco producing country and they don't really tax it. So I don't know, packaged cigarettes, they cost almost nothing. So the whole place is stinks. From, I, I, Indonesia was my home for quite a number of years. So I, I'm very grateful. They treat me very well, but there's too much smoking there. And you can't even breathe. You, you can room and people are smoking. You have to just run out. I and mean, when you walk out, fresh air. So I, I want to clear up this, this pollution of idolatry that I have brought you through. Because you have to know. You have to know. Cigarettes kill. It's not pleasant. But cigarettes kill. Dangerous. And now it's important for us to wash ourselves and touch nothing unclean. Tanakh uses very simple language. It cannot be that salvation is reserved only with people with fancy PhDs and fancy titles. That's not possible. All this crazy talk. It's one Akkurish Baruch Hu. He's the creator. He loves you. He wants a personal relationship with you. And your knees should bend to him alone, your tongue should praise him alone, you should worship him alone, love him alone, have divakas with him alone, and renounce all idolatry. And I say this to you, my sweet brothers and sisters, if this little, I don't think we ever did this before, this little movement into examining the doctrine of the Trinity bothered you, bothered you, that's good. That means you're sensitive. That means you're in a room and someone lights up a cigarette. I can't even breathe. I have to run out. I feel nauseous. You know? So if you don't feel nauseous, there's something wrong with you, right? So therefore, it's very important to be aware that you're sensitive to this. It should bother you. It should disgust you. Now, not the Christian who's in the church. He doesn't know any better. He doesn't know any better. He doesn't know. There's all he's taught from since he's a child. He tells us, my Hashem should only have mercy on them. They should all do tshuva. And we should see the coming of the true Mashiach, b'mheira b'yameinu, quickly in our time. I mean, I mean. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi, so. for a great show. Thank you all for tuning in, Rabbi. Uh, you should have a refuah shleima and my wife as well. And hopefully we'll see you guys same time, same place next week. Uh, just keep, uh, we'll keep the updates coming to you through Facebook, YouTube. Be sure to subscribe to the YouTube channels, both uh, Rabbi Singer's uh, and mine. And then click the icon, the bell icon, and turn on all notifications so you don't miss anything. And again, Rabbi's books can be uh, purchased directly at outreachjudaism.org. Uh, click the free audio tab at the top and you'll find they have correlating title chapters in the book, not the same information. Uh, the audio came first, books came later. So um, you guys have a great one. Rabbi, thank you so much. We'll see you soon. Shalom. Shalom, my dear friends. Hope this message finds you well. If you like the way this channel is going and the channel has been a blessing to you, please consider supporting the channel by going to the website, tanaktalk.com, T-A-N-A-C-H-T-A-L-K. Com. Thank you once again for your time and for supporting Tanakh Talk. Shalom. Shafa <laughs>